starting. That's, I know this is always the fun part, waiting for people to jump on. To jump. So we got. Bob Bennett is watching. Bob or Reba. <laughs> or both. Or both. Rosemary Blanchard Lewis is watching. <laughs> Jerry Watson Huff is watching. Oh, Emily Clark is on. Sam says hello. Hello, Sam. <laughs> There's Andrea Dennis. Just to find out from Andrea when Nathan's having his Eagle Scout. Yeah, when's, when's Nathan having his Eagle Scout uh, ceremony, Andrea? Uh, there's Margaret. Is she a newbie? Yep, Margaret newbie. Penny's on. If I don't call your name, it's because I don't get all the names. All the, not all the names pop up on here. So Cindy's watching. We're up to about 22. So Trouble's watching. That's Goldie Walter. <laughs> That's Trouble. Uh, probably when we have confirmation, I, Andrea says. So. Nora's on. Emily says, nice haircut, Father. Thank you. Feels <laughs> a lot lighter. <laughs> <laughs> this is the week everybody gets a haircut <laughs> around here. So, Well, let's get started. Good evening, uh, everyone. I've not seen any questions yet. So uh, Shirley Ramage is on. Flora's on. Um, Liz Krenzer. I think everybody's out partying for Cinco de Mayo, perhaps. Oh, man. Uh huh. Or maybe they're partying and watching this too with their Corona. <laughs> Not the coronavirus, but the corona liquida. <laughs> Bing Craig appreciates your taste in movies. Jojo Rabbit was one of his favorites of wow. last year. Great. So. Good. Good. Yeah, it's a really good show. Oh, Liz Krenzer must be in New York. She uh, says they're still sheltered in place. Wow. So. All right. Well, the, the, t the title of this live broadcast is Questions and Answers, but uh, so far we're needing some questions. So, oh, Tatiana Rodriguez. Oh, Tati. She wants to know what your Cinco drink of choice is. <laughs> uh, Margarita on the rocks. Ah, are there any Christian, uh, Ben Craig asks, are there any Christian apologists that you have a particular liking of? Wow. If you're talking about apologists who are Christian, I go all the way back to uh, Justin Martyr in the second century, who I really like, who described the Eucharist that we still celebrate the basic format of today and uh, who gave his life for the faith. So um, I would start with Justin Martyr when I think about apologists for the faith. Hmm. I think he was uh he was suggesting Trent Horn or William Lane Craig. So okay. um Oh Liz Krenzer is Jane McNeff's cousin. Okay. Uh every Jane McNeff has like an infinite number of cousins, it seems. <laughs> She's got cousins everywhere. Uh, Penny, I was wondering if Besides the rosary, if there is any novena or other prayers to celebrate Mary you recommend? We know uh, 
the two beautiful prayers that Pope uh, Francis wrote to conclude the rosary during the month of May are really lovely. One is shorter, the other one's very long, kind of covers all the people involved in the, who are impacted by the coronavirus. Um, but as far as other novenas, not directly involving Mary, but she's involved because she was involved in the first novena, the novena to the Holy Spirit, which we'll be praying, I believe, starting on the 22nd this year of May. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think of Mary when I think of that first novena, the nine days waiting for the coming of the Spirit uh, after the Lord ascended into heaven. So uh, I think she's a very central part of that novena that we pray, the expectant, joyful waiting for the outpouring of new life in the Spirit of God. <clears throat> Rachel Weaver asks, any timeline to open the church for Mass? Uh, tomorrow, Archbishop Coakley will release a statement that's going to be actually a joint statement with Bishop Condorla in Tulsa, so the whole state of Oklahoma will be on the same page going forward. He will announce when we'll restart Mass. I know it will be sometime this month. I just do not know what Sunday, or we may start with a daily Mass initially, but it will be starting sometime within the next uh, three weeks, three to four weeks before the end of the month for sure. Um, we are hoping to have our new building completed by the end of the month so we can have Mass in there because part of the requirement of celebrating Mass, I know, will be the physical distancing, I call it, not social distancing, but the six feet apart. So we'll be able to get more people in the new church, about three times as many as we could in the old church regarding physical distancing. Uh... Bob and Reba Bennett ask, what are the plans for the stations in the existing church? That's a really good question. I was actually just looking at those last week, Bob and Reba, and wondering about that myself. One, one idea I have, and we'd have to check to see if they're weatherproof, uh, it'd be nice to have some sort of outdoor stations, especially with all the land we have down below our buildings, to have people be able to walk the stations outdoors. So that may be an option, or... We may also be able to find a, a parish that does not have stations. Um, I know that there's a poor parish in Texas that would like our red benches, and maybe they need stations as well. So that would be another option as well, uh, to see if another parish needs stations. But I am noting that question because we need to look into it. Sam wants to know, what's your thoughts of Oktoberfest this year? Well, Sam, it's a really good question. Of course, a lot of that will depend upon the virus and where everything stands at that time with the virus. But we have more options this year than we ever have in the past as far as more space because we can use our old church for, for instance, the silent auction space instead of those small rooms over in the pavilion. Or we could use the uh, church for extra seating for the meal and have uh, more physical distancing there. Uh, my hope is that we do have it. We may have to limit the number this year, though. Again, depending on where the virus stands and where the guidelines are with the groups uh, gathering for that time. But we will have it. It may be a little different from years past, but we will definitely have it. Ben, in response to your uh, question about apologists, mm -hmm. he would have assumed Aquinas was the first. <laughs> so you went further back. Uh, yeah, so. I go back to the, uh, I guess, Ben, my, my favorite apologists are those who actually died for the faith. So uh, I like the martyrs, first of all. But Thomas, of course, with his uh, very clear and lucid presentation of the faith is excellent. Yeah, you got a point there. Excellent. Penny asks, I know that C.S. Lewis wasn't Catholic, but do you have any particular reservations about his writings? I do not. Actually, I find his writings very insightful. Um, I just had a, a brain blank. I'm having more of those lately. Uh, the Screw Tape Letters, uh, yeah. one of my favorite writings on the way the evil one works as far as tempting us away from the Lord. Uh, just very insightful. So, uh, no, I, I enjoy his writings and benefit from them. I think he's a very wise, wise man, especially in the ways of the uh, spirit, spiritual life. It had been interesting for him to write the screw tape letters. Well, you know, he planned a second volume, and he said he could not do it because to get in the mind yeah. of the evil one 
and started to think the way the evil one thinks. He said it just drained him of life, basically. Just that's very, very taxing. Interesting, because that's what I was thinking. Such a man of faith writing from the perspective of the evil one. So, wow. Yeah, very insightful book. Yeah, I'd recommend that, that reading for everybody, actually. Uh... Are they disinfecting the area where the confessors sit between confessors? Where we do the sacrament of reconciliation and have confessions. Um, as of right now, we've not been disinfecting those, those places because I don't know. I guess we could do it after we're all done. But as far as people coming and sitting in the same chair over and over again, and it's a cloth chair, uh, I don't really know how to disinfect that, you know. So it's a good question, though. So... Uh, we're we'll definitely going to have to look into how we're going to disinfect the church between masses. So that would probably be a good thing to look into as well. Yeah. There have not been a lot of people coming for the sacrament of reconciliation over the last several weeks, so it's not been a, not been a huge concern of mine. So uh, Bing Craig might be something. Is it Bing Craig or Ben Craig? Ben. <laughs> he's Ben Craig, he's but ben, uh, Craig. ben Craig. Uh, have you said what was going to happen with the old pews? Yeah, I was just saying earlier, Ben, that uh, actually I've had two requests. Um, uh, Donna Williams of our parish, married to Bobby, has a uh, priest friend in Texas in a poor parish who asked if he could have them. And then Father Cristobal de la Hueva at St. James also knows of a parish in Mexico who needs them as well. So uh, we'll uh, definitely have them used by another parish. The nice um, white ones uh, have the white cushions on them that we got from the cathedral. We plan on taking over to the new church and using for overflow seating because they're very comfortable. They're very, very good shape still. Yeah. So we won't charge anything for them. The main thing is whoever wants them, they come and take them. So come and take them. But your question really leads me to something I haven't talked a lot about yet, although we've been doing some work on, and that is uh, renovating that space and looking at what that would cost as far as uh, being able to use it as a parish hall. So that'll be one of the projects for the summer once we get out of that space. And I'll be sharing more information on that as we move forward. <clears throat> Gianna Daniel, uh... Thank you for all the live streaming you have done in English and Spanish. Sometimes my spirit feels beaten down, and your words restore me through our Heavenly Father. God bless you all. You're welcome, Gina. Very welcome. Uh, Tom Dubbs, my wife and I had our baby during the coronavirus, and we're wondering when we would be able to get him baptized. It's a good question, Tom. We hope... Once we move into phase two in Oklahoma and we get to that mask again, we can start having uh, baptismal seminars or baptismal classes so that you and your wife could come to a class and we would do the physical distancing and all at the class. And then after that, we could schedule a baptism. So hopefully sometime in the next couple of months, we could celebrate the baptism uh, of your child. Congratulations to you and your wife, Karen. Bob and Reba Bennett, is there a plan for the wooden statue of Mary? Deacon Paul and I were just talking about that today, actually, Bob. Uh, there's some areas, as you go into the church and the gathering area, and then the entry from that into the main church, uh, there's going to be some alcoves on either side, and we're deciding whether it would go well there. And there's also in the hallway of the uh, as you go into the church, you can go left or right down the hallway to the bathrooms or to the sacristy for the priest and deacon. There's some inset spaces that are very large that perhaps we could mount her on the wall. But looking at those two options uh, for the new church, but definitely want to have her over there. What has been each of y'all's most impactful part of this time during the pandemic? That's Emily. Each of y'all's? 
Each of I y'all's. Thought she was from Minnesota originally. Uh, she's, <laughs> she must be fully in Oklahoma. She's now. been Oki eyes. Wow. I'll let I'll let Dick and Paul start there. So uh, while I'm thinking about it, do you have anything you want to share right away, Dick and Paul? Well, I guess I would say that. Um, gosh, this whole um, this whole thing on social media and live streaming and. I mean, Emily taught me how to upload a video to YouTube. I've I've gained skills these last six weeks that um, I never thought I would have. Um, and for an old so, man, that's pretty amazing. Hey, yeah, you know, <laughs> young at heart, young at heart. So, um, yeah. Well, and and just, I mean, I know you probably experience some of the same being. Being at mass in an empty church is just, it's a, uh, uh, well, Easter was a, a mixture of things because, uh, you know, you, you want to celebrate this glory, the, the glorious resurrection of Jesus, and yet there's no people in the pews. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it was um, kind of a, a teeter-totter of emotions there. Mm-hmm. For me, the uh, one of the most impactful things is just being seen, seeing the response of our people and creatively reaching out to one another uh, with Altar Society ladies reaching out to our elderly, with the, um, well, Emily, with uh, Megan and you coming up with the creative idea of this new newsletter, monthly newsletter called Gifts of the Spirit, just another way to connect with people. The whole energy around the rosary and People coming forward to lead that and to share reflections on Mary. Um, And just uh, seeing how people in our parish have responded by trying to stay connected with the church and also with one another in uh, creative ways. And my sense is uh, some of these things obviously will carry over to to hopefully non-COVID world (laughs) uh, after the virus that are very helpful, I think, as far as communications and... and, uh, connecting with people so I'm just always amazed at how the spirit can take a difficult situation into the lives of people of faith uh, bring them closer to each other and closer to the Lord Penny asks are you going to use more incense in the new church (laughs) well Penny actually I was just talking with some priests about that uh, last week and we decided probably during this time of the virus that we will not do that right away because it would cause people to cough and then you get people get real anxious even if you have a mask on in church with people coughing. So we'll probably have to wait till post uh, coronavirus before we use incense, but it's gonna be an ideal space to use because uh, in our present church, the ceiling's low like my office here and the smoke has nowhere to go except kind of spread out over the people, but in the new church, we have such a high ceiling that, you know, that psalm that speaks at, speaks about, may my prayer rise up to you like incense, you'll be able to see that visually. So, um, but uh, I think the bishop may say something about that if he does, and I think we priests will probably just decide, probably forego incense, at least at the beginning, while, uh, you know, people uh, are wearing masks and may cough in response to the smoke, yeah. I have allergy issues, and I'm always self-conscious about my coughing. (laughs) I don't have corona, at least. (laughs) Um, Leslie Alvarez, very nice. Uh, Father and Deacon Paul, we miss you guys so much. How are you both? May God bless you all. I think I'm doing pretty good. Leslie, thank you for your greetings. I think this is your senior year, so congratulations on uh, your graduation. I hope you're able to celebrate that in some way. Ben Craig, this is an interesting one. Have you ever had any dialogues with Eastern Orthodox clergymen? I understand our church has reached out over the years, but I'm not sure where things stand on our relationship status. It's an excellent question, Ben. Uh, I personally have not, but uh, Pope Benedict and then uh, Pope Francis, they've taken some very important steps with dialogue with the Eastern Church. 
and moving us closer, I think, to the day when we can be one church again. Uh, that was the first split in the church, as you know, back in 1054, the Eastern Church and the Western Church, the Roman Church and the church in Constantinople. So um, I'm very hopeful. Um, and the main issue to resolve is the role of the Pope. And that's, that's what they're still discussing. How does the Pope play a role if they were to reunite with us, our Eastern uh, brothers and sisters, if they were to reunite with us? Penny, your comment uh, leads to something I've been wanting to do. Uh, she writes, you guys should see the little chapel I set up in my closet when you guys are live streaming mass. One of the things, one of the ideas I had was, and you know, we should do that maybe this Sunday, maybe this Sunday. And uh, Emily, if you're listening, you can take note of this and encourage people to do this during mass. But once mass is over, uh, take a picture of your space, of your uh, of your setting that you're watching uh, watching mass from. Take a picture of it and post it in the comments of that mass. That that would be interesting for all of us to see. So uh, uh, we'll 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 speak more to that. Um, we'll speak more to that uh, later in the week. But that I've been meaning to to do that. Encourage that. Good idea. Yeah. Uh, she also wants to know, how about bells in Mass? How about bells in Mass? Um, you know, there's a long history to that and the reason why we do or do not use them. Uh, just a brief summary of it. Um, back in the uh, Middle Ages and, and before, when people did not go to communion, in fact, uh, they may not have even known the language of the worship in Latin, they would be at the mass, they'd be out in the congregation, they'd be praying the rosary or doing whatever people do when they're not able to participate fully. And so when the time for the consecration came, uh, the bells would be rung so that people who did not come to communion, and most of the church did not, could see, see the Eucharist, could see the transformation of the bread into the body of Christ. So it became called uh, ocular communion. So you go to communion with your eyes, and the bells would alert you to that. So then you could go back afterwards to whatever you were doing out in the church. So it's, a, you know, it's an ancient thing that we don't really have a need of anymore. I know people, some people like the sound of the bells, but uh, since the Mass is in English and people hopefully are praying with the priest as he's going through that prayer, they're able to be part of that uh, prayer and not be snapped awake or turned around to see, oh, it's happening. It's happening. So. Uh, Darlene asks a good question. How will they get the piano and organ into the mezzanine? Uh, Father Jacoby is going to be doing that. Uh, he's going to uh, carry it up there. No, uh, actually, I'm going to talk to... Um, th there's a big piece of equipment that was used to hang the crucifix. Uh, about, when was that, three? Well, it was Holy Saturday. Yeah. Um, there's a big piece of equipment still in the church, uh, and we may be, I'm going to check to see if there's any chance we can use that to lift it up into the mezzanine. So we may have to part with the organ and the piano sooner than later um, for the, um, to, to get it up in the mezzanine. So we may have to make uh, different plans for instrumentation for the uh, rest of the masses in the uh, in the old church. So the question will be though, how we get the organ piano from here over to there? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, uh, I say that we get the Mustang High School offensive line here and get them to lift it and carry it over there. Yeah. <laughs> or oh, I, I I think we could we'll find somebody to help us, but uh, anyway. I can think of two Tylers that could probably just do it by themselves. Tyler Head? And, uh, uh, oh, oh, Yasmin's yes. uh, Tyler. Yeah. Uh, My gosh, I witnessed their vows, and I can't remember the last name. Ilse <laughs> and Tyler, yeah. Ilse and Tyler. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see them right now. Yeah. But anyway, you're right, those two Tylers. Could those two Tylers could, by yeah, they could just, they could go up the stairs with them, I think. Uh um, Terry Fancher, we have felt your heart during this time and thank you, keeping you in our prayers. Miss seeing everyone 
looking forward to when we are together again, interested in knowing the steps we will possibly be taking uh, in having Mass together. Yes, Terry, it's good to hear from you, too. Give my best to Christy. Um, yeah, we're all very interested in that, and like I said, the bishop will announce that tomorrow, and uh, we'll be figuring that out together. I do know that uh, as far as the attendance at Mass, one thing that he will say, definitely, will the dispensation to attend Mass will still be there. So no one absolutely has to come back to Mass if they still feel uncomfortable or unsafe. They can still be dispensed. It's not a sin. And uh, there's, there's some creative ideas going around as far as people coming to Mass and being able to keep distance from others. One is that instead of coming on Sunday, you could come during the week and uh, make that your Mass for the week because there's more space, obviously, at a, at a daily Mass than there is at a Sunday Mass. But um, once we get the news tomorrow, we'll be sharing it with you and, and figuring out how we go forward with all of this. Tyler Bowling. Yes, Tyler Bowling. Jerry yes. Huff. Good, Jerry, uh, thank you. Yeah. Tyler Bowling used to play football for the University of Tulsa. Yes. And I think he probably still could play football <laughs> for the University of Tulsa. Uh, uh, Penny says, I've been doing some ocular communion. <laughs> so, Penny, you're very uh, insightful. That's, I think, everybody just about has been doing that. That's very, very insightful. Uh, Carmen asks, when are we able to start confirmation classes and other things like that? Well, Carmen, I don't, I don't know if we'll have confirmation classes per se uh, once we get started with Mass again. I do know we'll have confirmation. And once we get the guidelines from the bishop and uh, from the governor as far as how many people we can have at church, we'll look at scheduling confirmation for some time uh, this summer, probably June or July. And we'll give... Give all the students and their families enough um, heads up as far as when that will be so they can make plans. But I don't see us having any classes this year. Uh, for the new confirmation, that will start up again in the fall in some manner. Some manner. I think I think Darlene is saying we should use firefighters to get the uh, <laughs> uh, piano and. And is Darlene going to be here? <laughs> yeah, you you can be here too, uh, Darlene. You can you can uh, you can supervise those firefighters. So, uh, Ben Craig, boy, he he's really asking some uh, philosophical and uh, the, theological questions. Time permitting, a follow up. Doesn't the Orthodox Church also disagree with the filioque who proceeds from the Father and the Son in the Creed? Well, that's, that's very true, Ben. Uh, I don't think that's as big a sticking point as far as working that out with them as the role of the Pope. That's really, from all that I've read and heard from Pope Benedict and Pope Francis and their efforts, seems to be the role of the Pope. But you're right, how the uh, Spirit proceeds and comes to us. Yes, that's very true. Will the second graders that were supposed to have their first communion this year have to retake classes again? <laughs> we're going to make those little seven and eight-year-olds go through a whole other year. No, no, we're not going to do that. Actually, uh, no, they're just going to celebrate first communion. Uh, so, again, we'll have to find a date for, for that and figure out how we do that. Because we have, and Jerry can probably tell us, uh, with our, our teachers, probably about 80 to 100 kids between the second graders and the older kids to celebrate. Mm -hmm. So we may have to have a number of different masses to, to do that with, with physical distancing, but they won't have to retake their classes, no. Shirley Larios, I can answer this one. Did the crucifix arrive assembled? No. <laughs> there were uh, five of us that uh, we brought that crate over Let's see, Jesus came in three pieces. We had to uh, um, attach his arms to the body, and then the, the cross came in one, two, was it four pieces or three pieces? I think it was three pieces. And then, um, then we had to attach Jesus to the cross. But it came, um, surely it came... Uh, the sculptor Gregor Musner came. Um, it was pretty obvious how to how to put that thing together, and it came with all the hardware. And I mean, it uh, it came together just like Gregor thought it should come together. So 
once we had all the parts, it was uh, pretty easy to put together. And uh, I tell you, it's it was quite an experience on Good Friday to, I was one of those that, that was taking the body of Jesus and adjusting it so it could be attached to the cross. Um, and that was, that was a very moving experience uh, on Good Friday to be doing that. It was uh, And amazing. then to see on Holy Saturday that cross, crucifix be raised up, and all the workers in the church stopped and watched that whole yeah, process. Yeah. They were all moved by that. Yeah, yeah. that was pretty amazing. Not only did they stop, they had their phones out um, taking pictures, taking pictures and, and videoing it. Susan says, can't we do Zoom classes to finish confirmation? Um, now, you're talking about adult confirmation, Susan. Um, and we may, again, we'll have to get with uh, Jerry Huff on that. There may be a class or two to, to tile that up and maybe even after you're confirmed to take some more classes. But yeah, that's that's true. So I was thinking the previous question just only about the high school students for their confirmation. But you're right, there's some adults that are being confirmed. That you may be able to do a couple Zoom classes to tie up some loose ends there. Uh, oh, and Jerry says, yep, at least 100. I guess we're talking about the kids. For First Communion. For First Communion, yeah. yeah. Uh, Penny, if someone has an illness, can they call the church to set up an anointing and Father, are you able to visit the hospital to anoint sick people? Uh, first of all, yes. If someone has an illness that needs to be anointed, definitely call the church and I'll make arrangements to, to get to you. As far as going in the hospitals, um, that's, it depends upon the hospital. OU Medical Center, at least in talking to some of my priest brothers, has not allowed priests in there during this uh, crisis to go anoint anybody. Uh, whereas I think the other hospitals have been more lenient about that. So the answer would be, it depends on where you are in the hospital. But definitely call me and I'll try to make arrangements to get to you wherever you are. Yeah, I think, I think as we move into these phases too at the Oklahoma, as we move into phase two, hopefully by May 15th, I'm hopeful that some of those restrictions will be relaxed so it'll be easier for priests to get to people in the hospitals. Uh, this is a question directed to me. Mary Jane, uh, uh, we took a little tour of the church yesterday, and uh, we saw they were they were making a place for a rail on the back wall, and I thought the rail was supposed to be... Uh, Mary Jane, the rail, there's a rail on both sides. It just connects differently on the, uh, on the altar side of that ramp, so there really isn't an issue. Um, it's a. Uh, it is as it's supposed to be. So as usual, I got straightened out. Uh, so uh, Ben Craig Elizabeth wants to know how the strings are holding the new cruci the cross up if it's so heavy. That's a really good question. <laughs> Those uh, steel cables are, are tested to hold a lot of weight, is my understanding. Because the crucifix, I believe, weighs between 300 and 400 pounds. Yeah, 350 pounds, 350 I think, is pounds, what it is. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. But those are special cables, yeah. Those are, what are they, aircraft? Uh, yes. they, they called them aircraft cables. Yeah. So, we were specifically made to hold that kind of weight. In fact, I think those cables are rated at twice of as what they're holding. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. there shouldn't be an issue with those cables holding it. Uh, Penny asks, were there any damages to the statues? No. They, uh, it's amazing how well they were packed mm -hmm. and, uh, in those crates, uh, it was, uh, there was no chance for those. Th I mean, I guess you could have dropped them from a plane, but, uh, um, but yeah, no, they were, they were packed very well. Uh, Gregor, who does that, he, he, uh, as the, uh, as when they hung the crucifix, there was some uh, skepticism from uh, from the uh, the Timberlake um, from Paul the uh, superintendent. superintendent. Yeah, he was he was skeptical about where those cables were to be placed. And after they hung the crucifix and saw that it was hanging um, uh, perfectly vertical, 
Paul said, I guess that guy knows what he's doing. I said, yeah, he's done a few of those. Um, and we're anxiously awaiting to install, of course, the Blessed Virgin Mary uh, and the, uh, the Child Jesus with St. Joseph. So hopefully yeah. you'll be able to see those sometime soon. They're beautifully done. Mm -hmm. Beautifully done. Sam, will there be prayer candles? Be pl will the, where will the prayer candles be placed in the new church? I'll turn that over to Deacon Paul. Uh, we'll have prayer candles back in the, the niches at the back of the church, one set over by Blessed Stanley Rother, and one set over by the image of Our Lady of Guadalupe. So that's, uh, in fact, uh, Ziegler's, there was a representative from Ziegler's here yesterday taking measurements um, as, as to how that could work back there. So, And when Deacon Paul says the back of the church, back back around the baptismal area. Yeah, so yeah. So you walk in from back there and then you go on up toward the altar. So yeah. So there's a, I think I posted it on Facebook uh, last week, week before, uh, we've ordered a, uh, a canvas uh, image of Our Lady of Guadalupe that is 37 inches wide, 47 inches tall. And then we've ordered a canvas icon of Blessed Stanley Rother that is about the same dimensions. Uh, so those will be placed in those niches back there. Terry Fancher, if I remember, cameras in the new church will be used mm -hmm. for online yes. as evangeliz evangelistic outreach. Yes, and as outreach as well, Terry, to uh, our vulnerable parishioners who won't want to come back to Mass right away. So they'll still be able to watch the Masses being live streamed from the church. Yeah, that was uh, way back... A couple years ago, when we started this process of deciding about the cameras and what we would do for audio and visual, uh, we decided to take those out to $20,000 cost, uh, but we put that back in. We're going to find the money because um, I want to be able to stay connected, and I think we all do, with our vulnerable population so they can still watch the Mass and participate in some way from their homes. Yeah, when we do that, there'll be a whole nother skill set that we have to learn. So. Dick and Paul will have to learn how to do that. So, <laughs> yeah. Nicole Craig, will you have rugs that you use to help with slickness on the floors in the new church when it rains or snows? <laughs> that's that's a good question. There'll be obviously uh, mats, uh, doormats at every entry, big ones. And uh especially in the main entry, we have what do you call a mini vestibule there that will yeah. hopefully catch all of that. Uh, but in the church, surprisingly, my experience of the stained concrete at the previous church I was at, St. Eugene, it, it wasn't that slick. Uh, maybe it's something the way they do the work. Uh, there will be rugs up around the altar and the uh, uh, ambo and the whole area there for people as far as going up in that area as well. But. Uh, not too, too worried about that as far as we'll hopefully catch people as they come in with the doormats. Okay. Darlene, it would be awesome if our first mass back could be the blessing of the new church. Uh, yes, that would be awesome, <laughs> Darlene. Uh, that's... That's just up in the air right now because, um, yeah, we'll have to see how we're going to do all that as far as the physical distancing and the regulations and everything. So hopefully we're back in the new church by the time Pentecost rolls around because that would be ideal to be able to celebrate Pentecost in the new church, which is the last Sunday of this month, the 31st of May. It's Pentecost Sunday. Andrew, Angela Riddle writes, <clears throat> Will the ushers need new safety training for the new church? It's an excellent question, Angela. Yes, because of the um, responsibility of the ushers as far as making sure people are getting into the church and practicing physical distancing and then coming out from uh, the pews for communion, making sure, again, the line is spaced out there for physical distancing and just assisting people um, at our English masses, most of our ushers are over 65 and in that uh, vulnerable population. So um, I would expect that some of them would not want to serve at this time, which I would understand completely. So we'll probably have to train some new ushers as well to help with that. 
but yeah, definitely we'll have to have special training for the ushers. So. Uh, Roxana, I will have Father Jacoby contact you uh, directly about that. Uh, Penny, I have not tracked down, I've not looked at that video from last week to see if we can see if those tools were there on Sunday when I did that church tour or yeah, it was Sunday. Um, Angela, where will the St. Vincent de Paul poor box be placed? That's an excellent question, Angela. We thought we'd wait till they got the space finished and then go over there and try to figure it out, but it'll be there somewhere in the new church. Uh, we just not decided where, and probably would not want to secure it too wherever we put it. Uh, but someplace visible when you walk in, either in the gathering area or right at the back of the church. So, it's a good question. Oh, Jeffrey. Will you need help at any time to move anything from the old church to the new church? I am available. Uh, how are you with pianos and organs, <laughs> Jeffrey? Um. <laughs> uh, actually, it's an excellent question because yeah. we will need to move over uh, the hymnals. Uh, mm -hmm. There's uh, some things that uh, Elizabeth has here with music and uh, music files that will have to be taken up to the uh, choir loft. Um, all the sacristy stuff, mm -hmm. you know, we'll need to move over. All mm -hmm. the sacred vessels and all the vestments and all the altar cloths. So, yeah, we will put out the word when we need all that help because we, uh, it would go a lot faster if we had people to help us carry everything from here over there. So, excellent, uh, excellent suggestion. Tati asks, what is your favorite physical part of the new church? I answer that in two ways. In a general way, just walking in from the back past the baptistry into this, it's just an expansive space. It's a much larger larger space than I felt it would be when we did the design. So it just, uh, it's not overwhelming either, but it's just a, a fullness to the space as I walk in from the back. Specifically right now, just uh, I'm looking at that crucifix. It's just a beautiful crucifix in it. It sits there, hangs there, right in front of the, the window behind it. And if you're there for a few minutes, you can see the clouds moving behind it. So just a beautiful effect of the sky and clouds behind the crucifix that really brings uh, that beautiful uh, work of art to life. Yeah, and the natural light in there. Yeah, the is, natural light's really beautiful. It's really stunning. Um, it's going to be interesting when all this stuff gets in there, too. I mean, the once the altar and the altar of repose and the tabernacle, it's just, uh, uh, at least for right now, mine is the that natural light. And the other part, I think, too, is the uh, beautiful Holy Spirit mosaic over the front entrance. I was just looking at that this afternoon as the uh, western sun was hitting it. It just oh, sparkles yeah. and glows, and it's yeah. just like... Uh, the spirit's alive right when you walk in the church, right underneath that dove on yeah. the gold. Yeah. Cindy asks, any more thoughts about an outdoor mass? Uh, not really, just because it's, um, unless people were going to stay in their cars, and I don't really like that the best. We just don't have a lot of options as far as a flat space to put people outdoors. Uh, and again, once we get into the new church, we'll have a lot more options as far as a lot more people being able to sit in there and be distant from others. So, and I guess the final part of that question would be uh, Oklahoma weather. You just never know. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Susan, will face masks be required in church if there is still dan danger of contagion, even if the state does not require it? Excellent question, Susan. Uh, my understanding is that it's going to be encouraged by the Archbishop. Again, we'll see what he says tomorrow. With uh, Tomorrow he may just announce the start date and then later on give all the guidelines for worship. But my sense is that uh, we won't be able to require people to come in with the face mask on, but we can encourage them to do so. And I always have to remind people the face mask 
is not so much to protect me, unless I have a K95 mask, you know, a really, really a powerful mask that protects. The face mask is to protect you. So if I'm like Peek and Paul and I have allergies and I'm coughing and stuff, I'm not coughing out into your space. So uh, out of respect for others, I would hope people would wear them. Uh, I think what they're trying to work out too is the details of how you receive communion uh, uh, with the face mask. So, uh, but I'll, I'll have more details for you hopefully in the near future about that. I, along those lines, it made me think of uh, there was uh, online a photo of a priest giving out communion in a German church, Catholic church, and they had this big kind of four by four plexiglass in front of him, and uh, below it was open. And so the, the woman I was receiving communion came up and stuck her hands un underneath and he placed the blessed uh, body of Christ in her hands. So there was no uh, uh, way for her to sneeze or cough on him nor for him to do the same. So neither of them had mask on. And uh, as only the Germans can do, they would think of that. <laughs> I don't think we'll be doing that because it'd be kind of hard. They had to have some, you know, uh, it was like a chalkboard almost in there that they had, you know, it was all plexiglass. Kind of a, like a bank teller. Right? Yeah, kind of like a bank teller, yeah. 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 Mm. <clears throat> uh, Bob and Reba Bennett, any news on installing the baptismal font? Um, I actually have a answer to that. I was talking, I don't think I told you about this. I was talking to Ron today and they've been in contact with the company in New Hampshire, and there's somebody up there that is maybe willing to fly down. Okay. Uh, one person, if they can supply um, a carpenter and uh, somebody else to to help him. Uh, so there there may be some movement on that front. That's so great. We'll, yeah, so we'll see. That's uh, Ron. Ron Ron is the project manager for uh, Timberlake. And uh, he was the one that, that told me that today, so. I've been thinking too, getting back to the question about mask and communion and the whole thing during this time of COVID-19 worshiping. I mean, there's just a lot of things to think through, which uh, hopefully we can think through of them before we get started. But one small thing is that everybody would need to come up in the communion line. So you couldn't have a child or non-Catholic spouse or someone who's Catholic who feels like they're not worthy to receive, say, in the pew, because then other people would have to crawl over them. So those kind of things, you know, we just have to think through all those things about communion mm -hmm. so that everybody would need to come up, even if you're not receiving, in order to go back in an orderly manner and not get crawling over people. Mm -hmm. So just, again, it's a new world when we think about how we do that. Penny asks, when is the altar supposed to be delivered and installed? That is going to happen after uh, after the marble is installed up on the uh, up in the altar area. So, um, and I'm not sure when did they give a time? They didn't. Sometime, hopefully, in the next week or two. Yeah. So that the the. Uh, there's, there's sheets of that marble that are going to be placed up on the altar. And that stuff has to be set in place, and then it has to be given sufficient enough time to dry, uh, especially when you're putting something uh, that is the weight of both. The, the, the ambo is, 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 while it's smaller, it's still pretty heavy. There's a lot of marble to that. And then, um, and then that altar... The mensa, that, that's the table part that goes on top. Um, uh, I noticed that Margie is watching. I think she, uh, Margie, if you know how much that mensa weighed, it seemed to me like you told me that one time. Uh, that thing is, uh, Margie is from the, the cathedral and she's, um, we are very grateful to her because she's, uh, she's, she's helped us uh, get that altar. And, um, but I, 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 it's it's heavy, uh, and so that that flooring needs to be that flooring needs to be stable before we can uh, try to put a altar up on it. So, but I have talked to the guy at Ziggler's in Tulsa, who's uh, Mike Ziggler, who's putting all that together, and uh, so he probably is. I mean, he'll just need a few days to to put that uh, to 
put that altar together. They've been they've been assembling it up in Tulsa. And now they're disassembling it so that it can be shipped and put together. I have to share something before the next question. I was with a family from St. Eugene earlier this week, and um, the kids were kids in the grade school there when I was there when we built the new church, and they had prayed the new church prayer for six years, eight years, or whatever, before that church was constructed. Now they're all young adults, uh, and they remembered the prayer. <laughs> they were saying the new church prayer from St. Eugene from memory, even though that church was dedicated eight years ago. And I, I've noticed a lot of our young people and adults, too, when we pray that prayer at Mass, they've got it memorized. So I wanted to tell you that once we are in the new church, we won't be praying that prayer anymore because it's a prayer asking the Lord to help us to build this beautiful temple for his glory. But uh, we will be praying another prayer the first year while we're in the new church, the prayer of thanksgiving. Um, Father Boyer uh, helped, well, he wrote both prayers, actually, so we need to thank him for his uh, uh, ability to compose beautiful prayers. But uh, I'll be sharing that prayer with you and probably conclude when we're done here with that prayer tonight. But uh, we'll be praying a new prayer for a year, thanking God for helping us do this. Bing Craig, what is your favorite music genre? That's a really good question. I really like jazz. Uh, my mom was a saxophonist, yes, and so was I. So I really like jazz a lot, Ben. Um, I also like classical music. Mozart is one of my favorites. In fact, when I compose homilies, I'm always listening to a Mozart piece. It seems to stir up the uh, juices in my brain and get them all going. So, uh, But those two genres especially. All right. Any other questions? Any comments? If you have them, now is the time to uh, uh, Mary Jane asks a question. After we resume receiving the Eucharist, will I be allowed to bring the Eucharist home for Ralph since he will not be attending until it is determined to be completely safe? That's an excellent question, Mary Jane. Uh, that's one thing I know the task force is working out, whether we can have communion taken to those who are not there, um, especially communion ministers to the elderly. So uh, I do not know the answer to that, and uh, hopefully we'll be hearing that sometime in the near future about what, what we can or can't do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I just want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, your questions are always, uh, uh, it's good questions, really. It gets us to thinking about things that perhaps Deacon Paul or I haven't thought about uh, fully, but also just good to connect with you. So I'd like you to conclude with this prayer of thanksgiving that we'll be praying for the whole first year we're in the new church. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Holy and merciful God, we rejoice with grateful hearts as we gather in this new and holy temple raised to your glory. The mission and message of your Son is revealed and proclaimed in this place. Your spirit, poured into the life of this faith-filled family, inspires, purifies, and sanctifies us for generations to come. Renew us now with that same Holy Spirit, whose gifts strengthen our service in your name. We praise you, we bless you, we give you thanks for this day, and for every day we celebrate in this place, made holy by the sacrifice of your Son. In the name of Jesus, every knee must bend. And in his name, we pray now and in all ages to come. Amen. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all for joining us. We will see you next week. Stay tuned. We'll have announcements about uh, tomorrow with the Archbishop's uh, communication going out. And uh, no doubt there's going to be some questions generated from that. So, um so stay tuned on uh, Facebook, Father's uh, Messages, uh, which, by the way, the one you recorded today, I still need to upload. So be 
be looking for, your, uh, for his latest message, Tuesday message in your email uh, later this evening. So God bless you all.